According to UNICEF, out-of-school children in Nigeria hits 20 million. And President Buhari says corruption is undermining government's investment in education. Tonight, we begin a town hall series counting down to the 2023 elections as 2022 winds down. This is Cross Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. The President Major General Mohamed Buhari has said corruption undermined his administration's achievements in the education sector. Now, this came about eight months after members of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, on February 14 started their ongoing strike. In spite of efforts by government, many more Nigerian children are dropping out of school daily. Now, in three years, major unions within the education sector had, had cause to down tools, putting students, parents, and the entire country in a state of frustration. Data obtained from the website of the Central Bank of Nigeria revealed that Nigeria's educational sector suffered massive capital flight during the regime of President Muhammadu Buhari. Specifically, using the CBN's balance of payment statistics, Nigerians have spent a hefty sum of $3.5 billion on foreign education in the past seven years. What's running us to discuss this is Professor Richard Wok Aduche Wokocha. He is a professor of law at the River State University. Ikechi Wogu is also joining us. Uh, he's an educator and a national transformation agent. Uh, also joining us is Dr. Akin Akinpelu. He is the principal consultant Erudio Hub. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Good to be here. Merry Christmas. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Merry Christmas. Okay, great. I, I'm going to start with uh, um, Akin. Akin, you obviously are in Lagos, so we'll talk. We'll start with Lagos education. Um, looking at the statistics that we have, I mean, 3.5 billion dollars is a lot of money, mm. especially for a country that's still looking for forex to deal with a lot of things, and of course, facing a downturn. Um, a few months ago, Ondo State Government uh, decried the fact that a lot of children are being taken from public education and now taken to private schools. And they wanted to make a law of sorts um, that would deter teachers who had children in private schools um, from doing that because they feel that it's killing public education. But the question is, uh, what about the elites? That's interesting. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I, I, I like the statistics that you put forward, you know, and um, majorly, one of the, I'll first take you through the back end to understand why these things happen, you know. So, um, I, the elites, okay, well, the elites always have a way around things. But if you look at it, education in Nigeria is quite funny. Hmm. It's in a funnel where you will find out that, so you have over 10 million out-of-school children, then you, um, Lagos is accounting for about 19%. Of that, you know, and uh, what is causing that is this Lagos, they want to do more, they want to provide good education for them, but they don't have the land space now. So, evolve you had evolution of about 20,000 public um, private schools helping them out to see that you don't you want to do this because the law actually says that you should be responsible for um, early your elementary stage education for all your children, as mm -hmm. it were, you know, so but they can't. They want to, but they can't. So there are many factors that you need to look at before you begin to talk about, okay, so what happens to the elite and what do they do around it? So somehow there's a loop that is just all around it that we need to be able to diagonize out, then understand why these things are happening. So this now brings you to the discourse between the public and the private sector. And there's a whole lot that goes on with them. Mm. You know, so for example, the say, um, I, I was privileged to be in a dialogue between uh, facilitating a, a talk between the public um, public sector and the private schools. You know, so and they had conversation. And the private school leads are saying, "Men, we are the, the attrition rate is high now. We have serious problems. Mm. Uh, we are, we have to pay about 26 kind of levies 
And so post pandemic, um, the, the pandemic crisis, post, post it now, where are they going from here? So they have to pay for um, driver's levy, development levy, local council levy, signage levy, radio levy, TV levy, all kinds of levy. And the attrition rate is getting high. And these guys are saying, we are getting tired. And you know, the moment that happens, the human capital of the state and of the country is already jeopardized. Mm. So I think that there, there are more of um, really intricate things to look at as we begin, now begin to balance of what happens between them and we talk about what happens to the L. The reason why I ask that question is because we have leaders uh, who, who are supposedly to, to lead us by example because many would point fingers at those people who are leaders today that they were beneficiaries of the free education um, back in the day uh, but that's not necessarily the case now and then there, there are many excuses for why we cannot have free education as it was back in the day because things have changed yeah. but then if you're telling me who's struggling to get my child free um, well be better education in, pri in a private school to not do that and bring my child to a public school where I'm even struggling to get paid um what about you are you willing to bring your own children from the private schools to mm. to the public school and what level of education is available in the first instance i'll tell you what for example in river state and i'm going to toss that question to you professor walker china a bit i have had people send me pictures and videos of classrooms in river state a state where the president would say uh, or well you know the whole country would say the governor is walking his mr project but then how much of those projects have been allocated to schools, to primary schools, to secondary schools that are public under Governor Wiki? So again, if we're looking at why was the deterioration of you know, public education is the way it is, should we not be looking at the men uh, and women who are in charge of the system, especially the likes of Governor Wiki? Uh, okay, well, Ikechi, I think I'll toss this to you because you're also from River State, right? Yeah, so um, I could take that on. Now, the, the truth of the matter is that um, I think uh, most of the development we're enjoying in River State is interest-based. So the governor wants to project his interests. And to also begin to wonder, this was um, a man who was Minister of State for Education a couple of months before he became governor of River State. We all hoped that education would be the epicenter of his developmental strides. But... Unfortunately, it seems like uh, they have other interests in roads, in other things, um, other kinds of projects. So when he's called Mr. Projects, he's called Mr. Projects for everything else but education. You know, yes, he's tried to um, to down the, the cases of frequent strikes amongst teachers and education workers. But we, we still are not satisfied with the kinds and qualities of results we're getting, especially um, across the external examination. So education is deep. And beyond the infrastructure, which is suffering a lot of decay, yeah, we don't have um, as bad um, cases as we see on most of the screens, but then, you know, um, we, we have to maintain what is already on ground. And what is the effort? I mean, to say that in River State, as rich as River State is, we still have students who learn in leaking roofs, especially during the rains. We still have flooding in a lot of our schools and a lot of our facilities. So for some months in 2022, for example, there were certain students that were cut off from the basic learning environment because of excess flooding. And it seemed like the government was helpless. But then we're saying that the government that is visionary should think beyond 2022 and say in 2023, okay, this were the mishaps that um, the students suffered, the teachers suffered. How can we foster all this? But it doesn't seem to be in plan I mean, in terms of infrastructure, then you, you begin to also look out for uh, the level of participation of the private sector. And then the big question, like you were asking uh, your guest a while ago, um, how many politicians would want to have their children in the public schools? Thank God for the private schools where a few private individuals who are paying their taxes and who are being levied by the government are making efforts to bring on some bit of respite to parents. And so we can say that, yeah, we are not clamoring to all take our children out of out of the shores of Nigeria to do their primary and secondary schooling. We can have some bit of hope, you know, with schooling in, in, in Nigeria because some private schools are making the effort. And so when you look at this, you begin to um, reason um, uh, with the fact that government is only um, focused on the present. 
and has practically no plan for tomorrow, and it becomes really scary. Oh, Ikechi, I think uh, we're, ha we're having a little connection issue there with you, but let me toss it back to you here, Akin. Um, I like that we're looking at it from different, you know, regions. We're going to come back to Lake Osen. Okay. Go Governor Somolo has talked about a few things he's done, you know, in terms of paying school fees, WIAG, but we, we want to go down to the basics. Let's look at the budgeting of every state. Let's use Lagos State as a litmus test. Where is um, education? Um, looking at the SDG goals, have we been able to at least scratch the surface? And in the order of priority, where does education stand? All right, so um, I, I would take it more from the federal level than take it down to the state level. So the, the government is trying, I think President Barry's regime, he's tried to see how to increase it between 2016 and date, you know, but we did, I mean, so the past two years, we had like a 50% increment. He's saying by 2025, there should be like a 100% increment from where he is. And so what we are trying, what, what I'm trying to say is this, as so now about 1.8 trillion is going into that for education. So we're saying that, okay, that looks huge, that looks massive. I mean, for expenditures, for, for all of that, um, for the federal ministry, of education, um, we, are, we are saying that, okay, global standard says that the only way a nation can cater for the education of its people is to ensure that you have minimum of 20% of your budget allocated to it. So, trickling down, down to Lagos, so that tells you that the gap we have, we are just on about 8% thereabout, and we, are, we need 20%. So what happens to schools post the pandemic period? What happens to school? You have dilapidated buildings, you have teachers and all of that. So I, I think um, the Lagos has, has, has tried in, in some bit. Uh, teachers have been paid. Uh, we've seen a few of those uh, uh, schools well renovated and they're, they're getting better. I mean, so in the past three months, uh, for like a year, they've been doing a lot of renovation in the schools and the past three months there have been a lot of commissioning going on so i, I think of the um, Sawalu has he has made education one of his most paramount um pivots in this in this um government where he has placed education amongst the top five you know and i think education has probably the largest education uh, largest budget so somehow education has got priority here in lagos you know but there's still more to be done mm -hmm. you know because um many things that people look at is when you go into a place and you find a school not doing well or you find a school that is dilapidated it's not really it's not necessarily or directly the um the fault of the maybe the commissioner for education or the or, or, the, or the state governor and i'll tell you that the reason is because the, the the primary schools you know they are the state is not directly responsible for the primary schools i hope you know that yeah we do we do the, know the local the, the local government but then the question is where is the local government in the scheme of things okay, don't so forget these local governments are still fighting for their monies to be given to them directly. A lot of the duties of local governments have been taken by the state governments, and so there's a blurred line. But, so they, are get, but they are getting the allocation. The, now, it's been a battle, yeah. an uphill battle. But yeah. then, um, it's late in the day, but we can still start doing something. So I'm, again, I'm saying, there are lots of things that need to be done at the local government level, but these people are being micromanaged by their principals, the state government. The local government is not directly, um, they're not directly um, being micromanaged by the state. Really? Their funding is federal. I mean, so if you, one of the ways to get this really sorted is get the commissioner for local government and let them tell you the boundaries and the things that they do. You'll be shocked. They don't respond. They don't get, see, where you get your funding from shows who can control you. The funding is not from the state. So if it's not from the state, you can't control them. They can only give report at best. Mm -hmm. You can only woo them at best. So honestly, it's a, that's why I said that the funnel is a bit funny. So you check about leadership, you talk about leadership, then talk about, okay, the local government, what kind of leaders do we also have there? Do they, are there people who are very, very compassionate about education? Are they passionate about education? Or are they leaders by circumstance? So you check, a local, a local government chairman now has his own commissioner for education. And so you check the credibility of the person. Is the person also into... So you check it. If you go into the basic education right now, it's completely in a mess. Absolutely. So, and, the, and the secondary schools now have to start retraining them for them to get better. So in Lagos, you find that the secondary education is, is, is far better than the, the primary education.
Uh, but that's really sad because that's the foundation, that's the foundation that, of that you things. lay before you get to the secondary level. Yeah. But that, I'm, gr I'm grateful that you're talking for Lagos State. But because, again, Lagos State just had its local government elections. Yeah. Thank goodness. Now in River State, I don't know if we have Professor Walker Chair back, but I'm going to toss this to Ikechi. Ikechi, the last time, is Professor here? Okay, good. Well, Ikechi, the last time um, local government elections held in River State, I'm sure that uh, we know what happened. Right now, that issue is still dragged in court by between the APC and the PDP. And you and I know what the modus operandi is. These are all men that, one way or the other, uh, allegedly have been put in there by the governor who are loyalists to the governor. How can we say that these people cannot be micromanaged by Mr. Governor? a beautiful question. The governor is the prime leader of the state and my thinking is that um, whoever the local government administrator is, um, the governor should ensure that there's proper handshake, there's a proper alignment of vision. So what is my vision for education? Whether it's at basic level or at tertiary level or whatever, what is my... So So if, if the local government chairman or the local government council has um, whatever template they want to run with, they must align with the centre. That's why there's a central government, you know, uh, um, headed by the governor. So uh, the governor should not be, or the local government chairman or whatever, should not be absolved from any blame. It should be a teamwork, a team frame. We are headed in this direction. Because, of course, like in River State, we've had cases in previous administrations where the local councils were really not serious with education and then the state government had to come in there and, yeah. and try to construct schools, you know, like the 750 schools, 250 yeah. schools across the board. Okay, so uh, it should be a proper teamwork, a proper, you know, alignment of ideals and ideas. Let's get on the table. Let's have one symposium or one retreat or one summit and say, this is my vision as state government for education. And everyone plug into this, except you have some superior of course we're on the conversation table and let's chew upon it but to say that everyone is operating in isolation for me is not it's not credible enough and that's not what we expect at a time like this so we, we, we're having this conversation because we want to see what we can do better looking at how education has played out in 2022 whether it be primary because we're looking at state for now we will go to the texture education when we get the professor on um, but how do we better how you started by talking about land and space in Lagos, which is a big challenge. And we know that Lagos is mostly surrounded by water. But then a lot of infrastructural development is happening. So again, government does have the powers over whatever structures or buildings or land. Um, for someone who's interested in education in Lagos State, um, what are you doing in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and stakeholders to see how um, these kinds of issues can be addressed, especially as the governor is going for a rerun for his election? So, um, like, like I said, I, th I think Governor Sonwalu is, is doing his best for education. And interestingly, the Commissioner for Education is somebody very passionate about education, uh, Mrs. Falashade um, Adefisayo. She's doing so well. I mean, she's doing so well, I'll give it to her. I mean, so uh, why do I say she's doing so well? I mean, I could see a, a bit of the efforts that they're making. I could see a bit of the brainstorming sessions that go on. I could see a few things about what they're up to, as it were. But the, you see, you're saying that how much is the budget? You see the gap between 8% and 20% of what you call community best practice, which is that 12% is going to account for a lot of things. So even if you say that, oh, why we not having more buildings come up, how many can they come up? You see, we said Lagos is responsible for 19% of the 10 million out-of-school children. And so, I, you, see, the best is to see a better collaboration between the, the, prime, the private schools and the public schools. Because the government of Lagos, I think, they don't have the capacity to build all the schools that will cater for all the millions of children. So the best thing is to see how do we collaborate with these guys so that they can help enhance. Are so, these collaborations in the work? Uh, because, you see, we can have these great ideas, and if we do not make a step or, you know, try to find out if these collaborations can be possible, then all we're doing is just jaw drawing and not well, taking action. Recently, the Commissioner for Education and the Permanent Secretary of Education, they called for, uh, they had a facilitated knowledge session between the private school operators and the public school operators, represented by the heads of, and the themes that they had. So and they had a jaw jaw together. I mean, so everybody had to say, this is the problem. So they brought somebody from Loma. I mean, so they had to bring the director from Loma, had to bring the director from the tax place. They had to bring um, about, about 16 parastatals. You know, because this 
these guys are saying that we are getting close to over 20 levies. Mm. How are we going to survive as an organization? So it looks like you want to stifle us and we are going. And the moment we pack up, then what happens to the children? We are going to jeopardize <laughs> what we call the human capital of the country, of the state, as, as the case may be. So I think that more um, collaborations need to happen. I think uh, more brainstorming sessions need to happen. I think that the, the state should be able to up accommodate the private, uh, private education sectors to make sure they are not stifled. I mean, things like uh, approvals of the school need to come in early. There are many schools that are not approved, you know, and a whole lot of that. So I, I think that they are doing their best, but there's still more that they can, they can do. Yeah. I think we now have Professor Wokocha back with us. Professor Wokocha, I, I'm going to ask you a very, very sensitive question. I lived in River State for six years, and one of the major issues, uh, one of the first things that I reported on as a, a journalist in River State was that a young child in... I think Genesis 2 or Genesis 3 was buried alive in a school premises while, uh, you know, uh, an initiation process was going on uh, for secondary school students. She refused, obviously, to join the court and then she was killed and buried in that school ground. Um, it's not enough to say we want to build schools. We want to have more children come to school. How are we impacting the lives of these children and how are we checkmating what happens within the school grounds and I'm talking about the issue of cultism I'll get to the university version of it but then um, we want to grow education but is it does it just stop at teaching and learning education does not grow from the top um, whether it's in the formal or informal sector uh, to get a rounded education it began from the very beginning and um, what we feed into the system is what eventually blooms uh, in the system, especially by the time you get to the tertiary institutions. Now, the, the average student lives in the society, and what is promoted in the society is what impacts the student's ideas of the way to go. Uh, I am afraid that as a society, we have to a large extent failed. We have promoted the wrong values, we have recognized people who have engaged in wrong activities, and we have not encouraged young ones to look at and uh, look upon those who have been responsible and socially responsible as role models. Now, in that environment, uh, it will be odd for you to expect the normal uh, to happen. So what you see, what you reported uh, in the school that you, you uh, talked about is it, it, just a reality of what we face today in the society. Um, those who carry the cordials and the guns and the uh, matches uh, have better recognition in society. Uh, look at your public service, and you find that a lot of people, if you go back into their past, they have records that are in public domain uh, that makes them unfit even for those positions. So in the circumstance, it's not surprising that you see what you are seeing at the primary and secondary level, especially the secondary level. I think it's reflecting the values that the society is promoting and is the more reason why we need to do something about it. Mm. Well, we're still talking education on Plus Politics as a town hall series and we are looking at the education sector. As we get ready for 2023 elections, what should we be adjusting and how can we better the lot of the education sector? My guest still in the studio, Professor Richard Wokocha, who's a professor of law at the River State University, Keiichi Wogu, an educator and national transformation agent. And also in the studio with me, Dr. Akin Akinfelu. He's a private consultant or principal consultant, I beg your pardon, of Erudio. Hub. Now, um, Ikechi, before we went on that break, a uh, professor was telling us about why cultism has become a mainness, such a mainness, um, especially in um, the, the schools in River State, just like I reported. Um, he talked about value and society, but let's talk about who the educators are, the people who are teaching in these schools, what kind of um, learning or teaching is going on uh, in these schools, especially in River State. Well, to start with, when you have teachers who are hungry, um, we could say that because their salaries are not even very reasonable. I mean, their take home can scarcely take them home and bring them back to work the following day. That's the starting point. And then it's not regular. I mean, it comes at the instance of the government of the day. Um, you begin to ask yourself, what, what level of dedication we would enjoy um, from this sector? And then you talk about influence. So 
a situation, whether it's private or public, we still have um, a cream of the students from the homes of the elites. And, you know, my father is better placed than you, so how dare you talk to me? Like the professor pointed out, eroded values from society. And again, society begins to admire these people at whatever level of oppression, you know, whether at um, the federal level or state level, who, I mean, I mean, the, who are toutish, okay, and they get away with these crimes. Nobody investigates them, nobody chides them for doing what they do. It seems like, okay, because you're some big man in quotes, um, you're above the law. And then we, we, we really don't understand, like we our, our, our world chieftains see titles and other societal titles to men who are known criminals. Okay? Nobody's asking anymore, where did he get his money from? What's the source of his wealth? Mm -hmm. So all of this, I mean, these are the children um, of these kinds of people. Some of them are children of normal, regular people, but they pick habits from the streets. And there isn't proper correction at home. Maybe because dad is too busy, mom is too busy looking to other, you know, other provisions economically. And so all of this would come together in some way to influencing the overall behavior and character traits of these children. Then they bring them down to school. Oh, I learned from this movie without proper guidance, without proper modeling. I learned from that movie. I learned from that big brother or the other elder sister that this is a thing. And then some children, even while I was in school, some children love to smoke, okay, in school because of, you know, a mix of peer pressure and all that. And then there is no parental influence in school because the parents are either not serious about their business, the business of coming to work on a daily basis and supervising these children and their outcomes. Some others are just particular about the academics. Oh, you did well in maths, you did well in English, you did poorly in social studies, and they pay no attention to mentoring and modeling. They pay no other attention. So you see a teacher seated in school, seated in class or in the staff room, and there's so much noise in the classroom and nobody goes to say, hey, stop making noise. So sometimes I'm driving to work, and you see these children strolling, it's 10 p.m., it's 11, sorry, 10 a.m., it's 11 a.m. You see some school age children in their uniforms still strolling to school. And you wonder, is there no code of conduct? All of these things just get you worried. And, you know, it, 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 just, it just adds up to some of the, 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 the despair that we see, you know, in the public schools. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's it. Okay, I think back to you. When I was younger, if you were asked as a child who you'd want to, who's your hero or who you want, you would want to be when you grew up, we, most of us wanted to be our teachers because they were our heroes at the time. Is teaching still as... <laughs> Is it, I don't know why you're laughing, but is it still as prestigious as we, we used to regard it? Do people even go into teaching now because they want to teach, because they love it, or because they want to earn a living? And, and if... I mean, I'm trying to understand... Are we there mm. where we used to be or have we totally lost it? Sadly, the dignity of the teaching um, profession has been greatly eroded. And so people do not find any form of dignity in going into that profession. So what you find in the public now is very simple. The teachers that you have, they are teachers, most of them are teachers by circumstance. I mean, those days you have people who are passionate to say from childhood, oh, I have a hero as a teacher, so I want to end up as a teacher. Now, you are finding teachers who, are, who got there not because they wanted to be teachers. So if you diagonize it, how did most of our teachers become teachers? So number one, that was not what they wanted to study in school. You hear they give me, they give me education. You know, when they give them education, they feel dissatisfied with life. And many of them just feel like, oh, they are not as good as they are, as their mates. So the moment they don't get another job, they go and settle for, for, for teaching. So some people have been looking for jobs for a while. And interestingly, they will tell you that, man, the only thing they can study, they can settle for is to be a teacher. So now, when you bring that attitude into the classroom, you are going to find out that there is no, there's no motivation. There is no, there's no form of modeling. They are not so excited about what they are doing. So you have a few things that you would say, oh, these are, these are values you should pass to the children. They are not even connected. They are mm. thinking of the business they have to go do at home. They are thinking of who they need to quickly reach out. And some of them have personal issues at home. Maybe because they are not paid well and they are, they are still suffering a little thing and here and there. So the problem is a whole lot. And so you go to the family system too, 
And so the family, oh, the parents are so busy dumping everything on the teachers. So the moment the teachers cannot do it well, they come to shout on the teachers. But honestly, the teachers that we have, kudos to the states that have been training their teachers, but I think there's still a strong gap and there's a whole lot that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Every day of my life, I almost interact with educators and teachers, you know, across the globe. And I just find out that many of them are not excited to be teachers. In fact, many of them are not proud to be called teachers. So I think that a lot needs to be done. So mm -hmm. the mental state of the teachers, apart from, apart from the monies that they earn, what about their mental state? You know, do we really care about them? So if you look at um, other countries, you go to the US or a few other places, it's quite prestigious to be a teacher. You are excited, you're proud to be a teacher. You know, and, um, and, and, and interestingly, I see a few things uh, Lagos have been doing these days. I, I see them award um, their best teachers. So I interacted with a teacher for the first time at the Lagos Education Summit. You know, I, I, I sat down, I listened to him on the panel session. I said, you're kidding me, this is not a public school teacher. And I, I, mean, I was, I was, I was so flawed. I was, I was thrown away, and I was like, "Wow, this is good. Something is happening." But the gap is still there. There's mm. still a whole lot that needs to be done. What's so we need to re-educate the way. teachers. Yes. Now go to the schools. Now, when they have been, when they are studying to become teachers, what were they learning? The curriculum, the teachers training them. Mm. I mean, so are we backward in our curriculum? Uh, is it obsolete? Is it still practical? So what we're teaching now, is it, 24, is it 21st century education? And all of that. So you bring that back into the classroom and you say that there's just a whole lot that needs to be done. So we may need to overhaul the teachers. For some, we need to retrain them. For some, we need to have a graduate conversion program mm. to ensure that their brain is washed oh, so that they can see and be better. That's Thank a you so whole much. political I talk on well. uh, <laughs> I mean, let me bring that to you, Professor Wokocha. Let's talk about ASU because, I mean, that's the elephant in the room as we speak. We cannot talk about all the education and not talk about tertiary education. Every year, we're churning out numbers of graduates and some of them can't spell their names. Some of them are unable to hold a job. And, I mean, the list is endless. But then, talking about the mental state of teachers, we talk about the lecturers who have been on strike mm -hmm. for, t for some time now. Um, can we say that the situation um, between uh, ASU and uh, the federal government and this pay um, has been overly politicized because government is also on that particular table. Government feels that this is overly politicized. Again, um, what needs to be done for grounds to move or, or for you know, the situation to get better? First, I think, um, yeah, first, I think government has um, demonstrated clearly that it is not interested in promoting education in Nigeria. Um, I said this is the sense of responsibility. The challenges we are facing, uh, and it reflects even at the secondary and uh, lower levels, is more of change in environment and less of teacher quality. Uh, I agree that, like every profession, teachers need to be um, encouraged, they need to be retrained, they need uh, to be encouraged to, to do all that they can uh, to keep themselves up to date and to improve, to go beyond where they are. But our challenges are more environmental than teacher-based. Okay. Um, how many students do you have in the classrooms? What forms are available for the students to sit on to study? How do you teach 1,000 students or 500 students um, with your voice? Mm. And how on earth will those who are at the back, from the middle to the back of the hall, understand what you're saying? How about situations where you have students hanging around the window or sitting somewhere on the floor uh, in order to find the point from which they can hear the teacher? The problems are more environmental, and uh, there are issues that government can address pointedly. So I am convinced that government has lost interest in promoting education. And we appear to have funded on education. Or, um, yes, we have appear to have funded illiteracy more than we have attempted to fund education. Recall how many billion we have spent on um, feeding out of school children, whether or not school is in session. Uh, throughout the COVID period, we Oh, Professor, I'm so sorry. I, th I think we're having connection issues with you, but can you hear me now? Uh, Professor Walkacha, I think we're having a connection issue with Professor Walkacha. Uh, quickly, I, I think I'm just going to toss to um, Ikechi. Ikechi, can, can we pick it, pick it up from there uh, until we are able to get yes. Professor Walkacha back? Talking about uh, 
funding um, out of school for children and all that. And that number is growing, especially in certain parts of, of um, you know, the country. We had some statistics saying there are as much as 13 million out of school children in Nigeria, you know, at some point. I mean, the recent, I don't know if that has grown to 15 or 17. And, you know, you're raising, um, you know, a, a force, a negative force for the future that will come at us through banditry, through hooliganism of all sorts, through thuggery and all that. And if there is no real plan to cater to that population, then the nation will also stand at risk. And that is not also to identify with you know the, 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 the poor administration, the bad administration of schooling, for which we are raising constant we're constantly raising a mass underclass. You know, like Prof was saying, children who can barely spell their names. And these children will grow on to become teachers. They will grow on to become captains of industry. Let's not forget that the, the cream of our politicians, political leaders, leaders, ministers, House of Representatives, um, members of the Senate and all that, a lot of them, or all of them, would have come from schools in Nigeria. So if we don't pay particular attention to basic schooling and then education as a whole, at, at whatever level, especially tertiary level, you realize that decision-making will be tilted, decision-making will be slowed, and this would, this would, in basic ways, you know, slow down the pace of development in Nigeria, a situation where, you know, um, any officer, any worker cannot really stand shoulder to shoulder at par with his contemporaries in other parts of the world because of the, the, the relatively poor remuneration, especially relatively poor exposure to basic teaching tools, teaching aids, teaching facilities. And all of this, all of this is on the shoulders of government to do, like the prof was just saying a while ago, mm -hmm. government should plan. So what is the plan for education for tomorrow, the next five years, the short term, the medium term, the, the, the future? Can we have some hope on the vision the government has for education for the future of a nation like Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I tell you the truth, we're just sitting on a keg of gunpowder because this will implode on our faces and then we'll begin to ask ourselves, where were we all this while? When all of this negative, um, um, you know, vices were building up and we actually kept quiet and did nothing. Mm. Talking about, um, you know, doing something about it, if not, we're sitting on a keg of gunpowder, Aki. Elections are around the corner. Campaigns are happening. They're give, feeding us the best and of fine and dandy words, telling us that they can even change water to wine. What should Nigerians be um, specifically listening to or looking out for in terms of what these politicians have to say as they campaign for the education sector? But those are, I mean, because if he affects one, he affects all of us. Yeah. So. so it's interesting that um, as, we, as we get towards election, you would hear a lot of promises. You hear a lot of high-sounding nonsense. You get a lot of promises come out. You know, so I, I think that it's also a, a point of call for all of us to be able to ask us. So I think like um, I, I can just say, said just now that uh, what's the vision? What's the vision? So when you listen to a man, and you, you, can, you see education is like the most important across all but. So when you listen to what the president has to say concerning education, you would look at the, I mean, look at the quality of what he's saying, check the depth of what he's saying, check the practicality of what he's saying, check the strategies that he's talking about. You will know whether he knows what he's saying or somebody wrote this thing for him mm. and he's reading it out. Mm -hmm. you, you get it. And so most times people should be able, I think that people should be able to gather and say, okay, with what you have said, we don't think that this is, um, this is good enough for you to say you want to do this. So I think what happens is that many times we are just excited about what they say and we don't go back to think about it. You know, so I think that as Nigerians and we should just be wise this time and let's, let's go for depth and let's see what can deliver. And that's what I'll say, I'll say around that. Mm. Um, Ikechi, I'm going to come back to you. We talk about capacity development. You see, politicians are very quick to say we're going to empower the youth. We'll empower the youth. I don't know what it means. I don't know if it's about giving them sewing machines. I don't know if it's about giving them motorcycles or generators or barbing equipment. I don't know what empowering the youth in the words of a politician means, but if we're not building capacity for young people as we you know, are building our country side by side, what is the future of Nigeria? 
the future is really scary. Um, I was reading something in the dailies just um, over the weekend. Um, so it's, it's, it's real. The United Kingdom is actually coming now to Nigeria. Okay, and they are scaling lower. So formerly it was our tertiary students. So that's capital flight. Come for scholarships. There are opportunities. There are openings in UK universities. Right now, UK secondary school schools, UK primary schools, are coming to harvest our students. So um, this is the future of the nation, right? When children who are 10 years old, 15, 20, and all of that, and of course the best of them, and nobody would want to go there and just walk back into Nigeria, because Nigeria seems not to have a plan for them, a suitable plan. I mean, it's crazy that you've had some scholars go abroad, and even when they return, they still don't find jobs fitting jobs with their good grades, with their first class and the rest of that. So it's, it's, it's really scary um, because when we talk about the empowerment in these parts, we talk about, like you said, sewing machines, we talk about um, hairdressing, teeth, like, uh, tool kits, we talk about bag, bag clippers and all of that. Otherwise, we talk about, you know, imagine like um, somebody coming to campaign, I'll give you 5,000 naira every month. On what grounds? What work have you done? We should create work. We should, I, I'm sure that the youth of the future, the, the, the Nigerian youth who's really aware of what he wants, what he studied in school, he wants a life for himself. He wants to leave his house in the morning and go work and contribute meaningfully to, to the value, to the value of the nation. He doesn't just want to sit back at home and get a paycheck. And if you look at what is happening, a lot of what is going on in Nigeria, whether it's the, the social media area or the or the entertainment industry, most of these guys, most of these young people are fending for themselves. They are creating for themselves. When we talk about the creative industry, we have Nigerians who have come out of their acute frustration and they are saying, hey, I can do this for myself. And then the moment you begin to do that, guess what? The tax masters come in and they say, you've got to contribute some substance to the nation. And it could be some bit of frustration when they want to clamp down on your office space, they want to shut you down. They, what did you contribute to my rising up to this place and so it becomes a little bit of um, you know a poor balance on the skills where i work so hard and then you sit in that exalted office you didn't contribute any meaning to my upbringing to my social life to my life after education and now you want to come collect this and so the the, the, the first thing you want to think about is how can i evade my taxes and so nigeria is particular is, is very good at creating mishaps Nigeria is very good at creating, you know, grounds for corruption, grounds to, to shoot herself in the foot, grounds to undermine herself. Okay, so when we talk about empowering youth, like you pointed out, we should be talking about trainings. Mm -hmm. What basic skills do our young people need to feed themselves in the future? Look at the nations. China and the rest of them, they, not, all of, not all of their young people go to universities. Not everyone would advance to university level. But basically, they, 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 they enable them with skills. Oh, I can do this. Oh, I want to end up with um, you know, the basic technology. They equip them. They engage them. They ensure that there are jobs. They send them out. They outsource them to other nations where they can find use for themselves. And some bit of this revenue comes back to the Chinese nation, comes back to the country, to the, to the national coffers. But in Nigeria, there is nothing. They just leave everyone to his fate. And then when you succeed, when you struggle and succeed, they say, oh, he's a citizen of Nigeria. Whether it is sports, or it is healthcare, or it is education, or it is any social sphere at all, the Nigerian nation, I think, needs to be more intentional okay. about her citizenry. The Nigerian nation has to be more calculated. They need to say, this is the kind of future we want to have as a nation in the next five years, in the next 10 years. This is the kind of administration I want to leave behind after eight years or four years of, of my political leadership. And then we want to measure the result. There has to be a proper appraisal system to say, was my plan effective at the end of the day? Otherwise, everything is just a chase, up, chase after the wind. And Nigeria is fast becoming like a joke where we stand before the nation. So that's my pain, really. I think the most important thing that you mentioned is a self-appraisal, which is something that... Uh, Unfortunately, it might be that our leaders are bereft of. But let's quickly bring back Professor Wokocha. I think we've been able to admit him. Professor Wokocha, uh, President Buhari has said that um, um, the education sector stinks of corruption. And he mostly was talking about the situation around the ASU strike. Again, he has said to young people that we should not see education as a means of getting government jobs. 
Uh, I'm going to allow you be the last say on the show tonight. Uh, where exactly do you think the president is going with this issue of not looking for government jobs? Of course, we all can't get government jobs. And then looking at the issue of corruption in the education sector, um, where do we start to deal with it? And um, how, sh how certain are we that we can actually deal with that corruption if it's something that it's, is generally endemic in the Nigerian fabric? Well, first, I think um, in the first place, the president seems to be realizing this too late. Um, this he should have realized uh, long ago uh, while he had time to do something about it. Um, secondly, um, while I agree there is an endemic corruption in uh, Nigeria, I think that the problem of education in Nigeria is not corruption in the schools. I think it is corruption in the system um, that the system that sustains the schools, that is supposed to program the schools, that should design what the schools are teaching, and that should determine what the products of our education system um, are. I think that is where the problem lies. It's not about what happens in the classrooms. Um, it, it's a good thing the president is realizing this at this point, but I think whatever we are to do is no longer what he is to do, uh, because time has run out uh, on this administration. Uh, it's, it's a question of our thinking of uh, what we want to do in the future and uh, uh, bearing that in mind in taking all the steps we have to take in the transitional period. Uh, but definitely uh, we are in a very bad shape uh, in the education sector in this country. And um, as uh, the other guests have said, uh, if we really want uh, to get serious in this country, we we'll need to do something about the education sector. Education shows you where a nation wants to go. The train wants, uh, one of the British prime ministers once said the three uh, most important priorities of the administration was education, education, and education. Mm -hmm. And it's a nation that has no place for education, uh, or a nation that treats education the way we are treating it like a private business, and not as a social service that is at the root of the nation's development, uh, has planned to fail. So I think we need to generally change um, um, the way we look at education. Um, EKT has talked about transitions, multiple transitions, and all manner of things. Education is not a business. And yeah. states that are serious, even the American states, invest public funds in promoting education at the private level. Mm -hmm. You must recognize education as a social service and one that is at the root of the nation's sustenance and development. I think if we don't head in that direction, I'm afraid we are marooned at the moment and um, until we're able to think ourselves out of that situation, we are in the woods. And for whoever decides or whoever emerges and takes over from President Buhari after the 2023 elections, should education be the first point of call or do we have bigger fish to fry? If it has the nation at heart, education should be the first important. He must fix education and then fix other things that follow. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you, gentlemen. Professor Richard Aduche Wokocha is a professor of law at the River State University. Ikechi Wogu is an educator and national transformation agent. And also, Dr. Akin Akinpelu is the principal consultant, Eridu Hub, who's also uh, an education consultant. Thank you so much, gentlemen, sure. for being here in the studio. We appreciate that. And we're hoping that these conversations can be had often uh, than once in a, a blue moon. Thank you once again, gentlemen, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, Merry that's Christmas. it on the show tonight. All right, thank you. That's it on the show tonight. Tomorrow we return with yet another sector of the economy as we discuss and count down to 2023 and all that we look forward to during the elections. I am Mary Anakon. Have a beautiful evening. Good night. <laughs>